Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Resolution Foundation uh, event and webinar. My name is Torsten Bell. I'm the Chief Executive of the Foundation. The, um, we're going to have an active debate today about what we do about labour market inactivity, which is what everybody's talking about in the last few months. And the reason they're all talking about it is because it's gone up a bit since the pandemic. We've seen fewer people in the workforce than we were used to pre-pandemic. And that's particularly traumatising for us because we got used to basically year on year increases in labour market inactivity during the last decade. And when something you're used to happening goes into reverse, blind panic is the basic uh, response that um, sets in. So we're going to focus on what is going on, what is driving that increase in inactivity. The, um, and then really importantly, some of which is related to what's going on, but not only, it's also related to what's going to happen. What do we do about it? What should policymakers actually do? Because some of this debate has been a little bit too much focused on in our world. I know some of you have lives, but in our world, there's a lot of very detailed like torturing of the data to work out, try to work out exactly what is going on. What are people saying in the surveys about why they are kind of retiring or why they are, why they're not working? It may be that the data isn't quite good enough to cope with that level of stress. So some of what people should be focusing on in policy terms should be based on what we think is going to happen in future, not exactly what did someone say they were reason they dropped out of the labour market was in 2021. What are they saying happened to today? Have they bothered answering the survey and the rest? So we're going to go a bit into not just thinking about what the survey said, but what does the future hold and what should policymakers do? And we're obviously doing that because we have a budget on March the 15th. Some of that, as those of you who are up at 7 a.m. this morning will have seen, we've got better public finance figures. But on the policy side, most of the focus is going to be on from the government is what do we do about raising labour market activity rates? So we're going to go on in the second half of this to focus on what do we do? What should policy actually change rather than wouldn't it be nice if this all went away or maybe it will all go away? That is the plan. Now, to help us do that, we've got a great panel. So first of all, you're going to hear... Um, uh, from Louise Murphy, who's an economist here at the Resolution Foundation and has written a great report that's out this morning on everything I just said. There, um, uh, with her co-author Greg Thwaites, one of our research directors here, who's also joining us in the audience. Uh, and then you're going to hear from Sir Stephen Timms, who's the chair of the Work and Pensions Select Committee, and just told me he's off to the States to learn, it's not a jolly, to learn about reducing labour market inactivity that's going on over there. And the US is really interesting because they're the place that has seen the most similar trend amongst older workers. The early retirement thing, insofar as it exists, is most visible there. And it's also the country with high private pensions. We're going to come back to that. But high private pensions, the um, uh, pension savings. So Stephen can tell us a bit about what he's going to learn there. The, um, then you're going to hear from Louise Hellam, who's the Director of Economic Policy at the CBI. Uh, there are two Louises. This is Louise Hellam, who works for the CBI. This is Louise Murphy. She works at the Resolution Foundation. Everyone got it? You're not going to get told again? If you ask a question, I want to know which Louise you're asking the question. Okay, if I can manage it, you can manage it. That is what trust is about. And then you're going to hear from Dr Fiona Aldridge, who's Head of Insight and Intelligence at the West Midlands Combined Authority, who is actually trying to get some people into work in the uh, West Midlands. And the Midlands is quite interesting because there's a lot going on. The Midlands has got some of the early retirees and some of the increase in sickness going on, whereas Scotland, none of this at all. And some places, just loads of retirees, and some places, just sick people. But the Midlands is in the middle, so it's got it all going on. Yeah, so that's all we've got. Uh, Fiona, so that is the plan. Now, as always, you can ask your questions on Slido once we've got through everyone's uh, remarks. It is uh, hashtag boost participation. We're very imaginative there. So go on Slido, hashtag boost participation, put your question in, and we'll come to those once we've heard from our speakers. So that is the plan. Louise from the Resolution Foundation, over to you. Morning everyone, I'd like to start by thanking my co-author Greg Thwaites and other colleagues here at the Resolution Foundation for their help with this report. So for the past few months there's been a flurry of news headlines and political activity focused on economic inactivity. This has tended to focus on the impact of the pandemic, particularly on older workers who might have left employment in the past few years. Policy responses have tended to think about how we might encourage this group of older workers to rejoin the labour market. And the government has gone about this in a variety of ways. For example, recently we heard the Chancellor appealing to national pride or a sense of duty by telling older workers that Britain needs you to return to work. 
They've also extended the midlife MOT scheme, which gives older people advice about employment and retirement. And there's even been rumours of giving older workers a tax cut. And this focus on economic inactivity is understandable. One of the legacies, as Torsten said, of the COVID-19 pandemic has been an increase in economic inactivity and not high unemployment, as was feared at the start of the pandemic. Indeed, while unemployment reached record lows last year, the UK employment rate remains one percentage point beneath its pre-pandemic level. This is due to a rise in economic inactivity. As we can see on the slide, the number of people who are out of the labour market and not looking for work or wouldn't be able to start a job is up by over 800,000 since the start of the pandemic among people of all ages. What we can see on the chart is that this has been concentrated among older workers. More than three quarters of the rise has been among people aged 50 or over. And this has been fairly evenly split between those who are working age, so that's shown on here in purple, those aged 50 to 64, and those who are over pension age, that's those 65 and above, shown in red. And this is certainly worthy of our attention. Not only will it impact businesses, we're seeing increased vacancy rates, for example, but it's not what we're used to. This comes off the back of a decade where labour force participation was rising quickly. On the eve of the pandemic, the working age participation rate was at a record high. But as we'll show for the rest of the presentation, while the current debate is focused on the right problem, that is rising economic inactivity, so far, it's jumped to the wrong conclusion that the solution is trying to unretire older workers. For one, there's good reason to think that policy will not encourage the cohort of older workers who have left employment to return to work, since many of, this, many of these people have come from higher paying professional backgrounds. Simply put, many of these adults who have left the labour market are living comfortably in their early retirement and there's little that government can do to change their mind. For example, as we can see on this chart, when we look at differences between 2019 and 2021, there has been an increase in flows from employment into inactivity among those from higher paying professional jobs. On the other hand, when we look at some lower paying jobs, such as hospitality, flows from employment into inactivity actually decreased. Not only have these workers come from higher paying professional jobs, but they're also more likely than others to have access to private pension wealth and own their homes outright. And this is consistent with the wider trend that people who retire early in their 50s tend to come from high wealth households. And not only do the characteristics of the group of workers who have left the labour market to enter early retirement make them unlikely to return to work, so too does the length of time that they've been out of the labour market. History tells us that those who take early retirement rarely return to the workforce. The green bars on this chart show that the chances of people unretiring are low to begin with, even when we can compare this group of people to another group who policymakers might think of as having high barriers to work. That's those with long-term ill health or disability, shown in blue. But what this chart also shows us is that people's chances of returning to work get lower after an extended period of economic inactivity. For example, someone who took early retirement during the summer of 2020 has now been out of work for around two and a half years. Historically, only 2% of people in this situation return to work every quarter. That's compared to 6% of those who've been inactive for just three months or less. And so instead of focusing on trying to encourage older workers back to work, we think that policymakers need to think about economic inactivity more broadly if they're to successfully boost workforce participation in the decade ahead. First, policymakers need to be clear eyed about the demographic headwinds that are likely to push down on economic participation in the 2020s. As the green line on this chart shows, if current participation rates for each age group are to remain at current levels, economic inactivity would rise by around 1.5 percentage points by the end of the decade. This is due to demographic changes. For example, the number of people aged 65 and above 
is expected to increase by around 2.5 million, or 20%, between 2020 and 2030. And this is not the only demographic challenge we face. There's also been a rise in ill health and disability among our population, and this goes beyond the pandemic. For example, the number of working age people with a disability increased by 2.3 million between 2013 and 2022. But there are some reasons to be optimistic that policymakers can make a difference. Demographic ageing is hardly a new thing, and we have successfully responded to it in the past. What we now see on the chart in the red line is what economic inactivity would have been over the past few decades if age-specific inactivity rates had remained at their 1999 levels. But over the past few decades, we've seen policy changes like increasing the state pension age, reforming benefits for single parents, and this, combined with societal change, has meant that certain groups of the population have seen big increases to their participation rate. These changes have combined to curb the rise in economic inactivity that we would have seen otherwise. And so we urge policymakers to learn from the good news of the past few decades and aim to increase workforce participation in the years ahead among the groups for whom employment has increased and who are receptive to policy change, but where there's still room for improvement. There are three main areas we think policymakers should focus. First, as this chart shows, in the past two decades, the UK saw participation rates rise substantially for older men and women in their 50s and 60s. For example, between 1999 and 2019, the participation rate for men between 55 and 64 increased by 10 percentage points, and for women this was 22%. What we can also see in the um, chart on the screen is that the participation rate for all women aged 25 and above increased over the past few decades. And in the 2010s, this was particularly the case for women in couples with children. And finally, employment among people with disabilities increased significantly in the past decade. For example, the employment gap between people with and without disabilities fell by five percentage points between 2013 and 2022. And the biggest improvement was among people with depression. We explore then some policy solutions which might build on this progress in the following slides. First, policymakers should focus on boosting employment among older people but they should do so by looking beyond the specific cohort of older workers who left employment during the pandemic and should also look at policy changes other than just increasing the state pension age. This is because any proposal to accelerate the increase of the state pension age up to 68 needs to be weighed up carefully. Of course, doing so would bring fiscal benefits in the long run, but we shouldn't think that it would impact economic inactivity this decade. And we also need to consider the significant impacts this would have on inequality, given that we know life expectancies vary hugely between rich and poor places and people in the UK. And it looks like reforms to private pensions are more pressing. In this regard, policymakers should consider increasing the age at which people can access their tax relieved private pension wealth. This is currently 55 and is set to rise to 57 and then stay 10 years below the state pension age. This aspect of the private pension system sets the UK apart from many other comparable countries and supports early retirement, particularly among wealthier people. Alongside this, we recommend that policymakers consider capping the tax-free lump sum pension payments under the existing system, a quarter of all private pension income can be taken with no tax due up front. And again, this encourages early retirement among wealthier individuals and comes at a considerable cost to the taxpayer. But older workers are not the only group for policymakers to focus on. Efforts should also be made to boost the participation rate among women with children, and doing so will involve targeted policy reforms both to the childcare system and more widely. It's understandable that policy debates on this topic do start around the provision of free childcare, and there are certainly lots that can be improved on in the current childcare system in the UK, with it being both costly and complex to many parents. 
But if policymakers' aim is to boost participation among parents who are currently out of work, we shouldn't see just increasing the number of free part-time childcare hours as a silver bullet. Instead, support should be focused on low-income households, among whom both women's labour market participation and the use of formal childcare is lowest. For example, at the moment, many low-income families have to choose between claiming childcare support, either through the universal credit system or through tax-free childcare. This is confusing and it's often impossible to know which is financially beneficial. And within universal credit, the childcare system is both complicated with payments often varying month on month and the high upfront costs that need to be paid by parents is off-putting. But as we can see in this chart, we shouldn't see that childcare as the only issue. Second earners in low income households, which tend to be women, face lower work incentives on universal credit than the first earner does. This is because when they enter employment, their earnings affect their household universal credit entitlement immediately. This chart in red shows that when a main earner enters work, the overall gain to the household income is higher than when a second earner, which tends to be a woman, makes the same step into employment. That's shown on purple. We therefore recommend that policymakers consider implementing a second earner work allowance in universal credit to specifically encourage more women from low income households to move out of economic inactivity and into employment. And finally, policymakers should focus on workforce health and its relationship with employment. The chart on the screen shows that this is an area where we saw big improvements in the 2010s. We can see that employment rates for people with all types of disabilities improved between 2013 and 2022. But one of the trends that we've been hearing a lot about recently is a rise in economic inactivity among those with long-term illness or disability. And this is a symptom of a wider health problem in the UK. Policymakers should first and foremost tackle, tackle boosting health and well-being in the UK for reasons that of course go beyond just boosting the size of the labour market. But there are areas where policymakers can help boost employment prospects for people with ill health and disability. Recent proposals from both the government and the Labour Party have tended to focus on reforming the disability and illness benefit system. While many of these proposals are a step in the right direction, they reflect that the current system is complex and there's often a more or less binary distinction between those who are classed as being able to work and classed as being too ill to work, which can dis disincentivize moves into employment. Hard questions remain. We should see benefit reform as lengthy and complicated, and neither party has so far grappled with the challenges that come with alternative systems. And finally, we would encourage policymakers to also focus on keeping those who become ill or disabled in employment retaining the relationship between the employer and the employee in early intervention is key and we would encourage policymakers to consider introducing a right to return period in which someone's job is kept open if they have to take a short period of time off work due to illness or disability. And so to conclude then the government is rightly focusing on boosting the size of the workforce in the upcoming budget. But to successfully do so, it must not focus solely on unretiring the cohort of people who left employment in the past few years. And instead, it should set out an agenda to boost employment among older workers, women with children, and people with disabilities and illnesses in the decade ahead. And finally, we should be optimistic about this. Demographic changes have been pushing down on labour market participation for many years, but we've managed to respond to this with successful policy change. What we now need to do is try to build on the good progress of the 2010s and not get too bogged down by focusing just on the experience of the COVID pandemic. Thanks. Great, thank you very much, Louise. Great. So hopefully lots of um, food for thought. Obviously you should read the entire report on the website because none of one's got anything else to do all day. Now, Stephen, what should the policymakers, politicians, what should we make of all this? 
Right. <clears throat> well, I think it's a very interesting uh, report. I was going to start by quoting uh, Boris Johnson, oh uh, who uh, on the 24th of November 2021 at Prime Minister's Questions, he said this. Now, almost a month after furlough ended, there are more people in work than there were before the pandemic began. Well, as we've just been reminded, that was, of course, untrue. Uh, but he carried on saying it. He said it uh, again in November, December, January and February. Uh, and in February, he had a letter from the chair of the UK Statistics Authority, which said, Dear Prime Minister, according to the latest ONS figures, it is wrong to claim that there are now more people in work than before the pandemic began. The increase in the number of people who are on payrolls is more than offset by the reduction in the number of people who are self-employed. The number of people in work is estimated to be around 600,000 fewer than at the start of the, the pandemic. And then at the liaison committee at the end of March, I asked the Prime Minister about this, whether he accepted what the letter had said to him. And it, he, he blustered in sort of Boris Johnson style, but he did eventually accept that his claim um, had been untrue. By that time, he'd made it nine times in, in Parliament. Um, but he, he said this to me, uh, what you're pointing to is a very interesting thing. For reasons that everyone is trying to get a handle on, it looks as though large numbers of people, possibly in their 50s, are deciding that what with one thing or another, they want to do something else. Um, so uh, he, he, what was interesting for me about that was he clearly, he understood it. He knew that his claim was untrue, um, but it sounded good. So he carried on saying it anyway. Um, and, and his final appearance at the dispatch box in July, he said... We have more people in paid employment than at any time in the history of this country. And I, yeah. Um, but he was at least right uh, last March that it is a very interesting thing and that everyone is trying to get a handle on it, um, as we are uh, this morning. Um, economic inactivity, uh, 8.4 million before the pandemic, uh, 8.9 million latest figures, half a million more than before the pandemic, 61% of that increase accounted for by people aged 50 to 64, and as we've been hearing, more uh, inactivity amongst people with disabilities as well, and uh, to, to some degree among younger people as well, but more young people staying in, in studying uh, longer, partly uh, explaining that. 80% uh, of the economically inactive say they don't want a job, but 20% say they do, and, and that's, you know, nearly 600,000 people who are long-term sick, 400,000 not working because they're looking after their family or their home. So that's kind of I mean, a million people. There's potentially a big prize here if we can uh, persuade some of those or make it possible for some of those to come back into work. So we're inquiring at the moment in the Select Committee into uh, employment support and the government's plan for jobs. As Torsten says, next week we're going to be in the, the USA finding out what's being done there uh, about this. Uh, so in the committee, we are definitely among those trying to get a handle, as Boris Johnson put it, on the, the reasons. And we've had some very interesting evidence about this. Luke Price of the Centre for Ageing Better told us, and I quote, it boils down to a very turbulent labour market during the pandemic. We also know that older workers face quite a lot of ageism. You constantly hear about workers not being as productive or taking more sick leave, often based on negative stereotypes that are not true. People might start to believe that they're past it. Uh, James Taylor of Charity Scope told us there are more economically inactive disabled people than for 10 years. Uh, he said 35% of disabled people uh, who left the job in the last two years are on an NHS waiting list. I thought that was a pretty striking figure uh, and that long waiting lists are a big part of the, the, the problem. Uh, Jane Hunt, Association of Disabled Professionals, told us employers need to do more to retain uh, employees and, quote, some employers are finding it very difficult to realise that some reasonable adjustments are very cheap to make. Um, others have highlighted... Uh, increasing difficulty uh, finding affordable childcare. Uh, we've called recently on the committee for people on universal credit no longer to have to pay that big upfront cost uh, for their first month's uh, childcare, and that, that is a, a you know it's an impossible barrier to surmount for, for for some. I think the idea of the second uh, earner 
uh, work allowance is a very interesting one uh, within universal credit um, uh, as well. Richard Rigby, Prince's Trust, told us in 2011, 11% of young people who weren't in employment, education or training reported mental health problems. That's now 30%. Uh, and they polled recently a group of neat young people about barriers to work. Mental health problems came out number one on that uh, list. So, on, you know, in terms of what's to be done, uh, Luke Price, Centre for Better Ageing, said older workers with health problems or caring responsibilities need flexible work. And I think there is something quite important there about employers recognising the need for flexibility. He also made the point that people often underestimate the income they need some people who left work thinking everything's going to be fine might actually find uh, in a year or two that they do need to get back to work after all. James Taylor of Scope uh, advised, go to the individual, understand where they want to get to in terms of their career and aspirations and go from there rather than a one size fits all employment support program. And we're going to, we are visiting in the States a, a program in Boston called Mass Hire focused on older people and I'd be interested to see how they are framing that programme. Billy Harding, Centrepoint, argued more community-based youth-friendly settings could be helpful in bridging the gap for those young people reluctant to go into the job centre to sign on and I think that's a, a significant issue at the moment. So I, I think it's absolutely right to make this uh, a priority. The government is right to do that. I, I welcome this uh, research today and, and today's discussion. Our report isn't going to appear until after the budget, uh, but I'm hoping we will have some effective practical advice to offer to ministers. Very good. Thank you, Stephen. Very much. <laughs> we didn't start promisingly, but we saw where you were going. <laughs> so we stuck with you through the difficult <laughs> lying phase of the talk. Right. There, Louise, CBR Louise. What's going on? Brilliant. Thank you. Um, well, firstly, uh, just thank you for inviting me to join the presentation today. I think this is a really important topic and obviously a, a great piece of research. And it really reflects a lot of the conversations that I've been having with businesses, particularly over this uh, last year, really up and down the country in every single sector. This has been the number one issue that firms have raised in terms of labour shortages and skill shortages. Um, we did some survey work ourselves towards the end of the last year and that showed that 75% of firms have been impacted by these shortages um, and of those, half of them said that it had actually impacted the extent to which that they could meet the output demand and a, a quarter also said that it had impacted the extent to which they could make investments as well. So these are things that are really holding back growth in the UK, as well as obviously having an impact on individuals themselves and, and their own standards of living as well. Um, one of the interesting things and, and kind of looking through your report in, in more detail that, that really struck us as well, and again, some of the thinking that we've been doing is the extent to which labour supply has really done a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of growth that we've had um, in the pre-pandemic period kind of since 2010. Um, and again, if we're looking forward to some of the forecasts that we have out there, and I think particularly the latest report um, from the Bank of England, they're really expecting that labour supply going forward is probably going to make quite a minimal contribution, particularly because of the ageing population. So there is a really big question, not only in the here and now, but also looking forward. If you want to think about increasing growth in the a country, and we've previously relied quite a lot on increasing this labour supply, and that's not going to come, we really need to think about where else growth is going to come to. And, and I think, again, quite striking for us of over the next decades, we're expecting more people to retire and then to enter the labour market. So I think this is going to be a, an issue that we come back to time and time again if, if we're not addressing some of these issues. Um, so we do really need to boost participation, but also I think there's a larger question about what are the jobs of the future as well. Um, but firstly, what to do about participation. So again, we've been doing our own thinking about this and, and putting um, ideas to the Chancellor ahead of the spring budget. And it's really um, <coughs> encouraging to see that this does seem to be a big focus of that fiscal event. We agree very much with you in terms of your report of obviously if um, you do have older workers who have left because they perhaps uh, got a, quite a comfortable standard of living, it's going to be really hard to bring those individuals back. So actually it's much better to think about some of those big groups who are 
in that inactive pool at the moment, particularly the long-term sick, as we've heard, make up about a third of the inactive population, and then those who are looking after home and family as well, which is, is about a fifth of that. Um, and I think as it's been widely reported, um, childcare, particularly for that latter group, is a big issue, and childcare costs in the UK are amongst some of the highest in the OECD. Um, so there are three things that we were really looking for the Chancellor to do at the spring budget. The first one is we think that we do actually need a, a wide independent review on the childcare system to look at this issue properly because it was obviously um, quite a complex one. But we do think that there needs to be some immediate action as well. And actually our focus is around um, making sure that the current uh, funding system for the, the three hours for three and four year olds is better funded to make sure that that better reflects the kind of true costs um, of childcare. But then also to think about rolling out some of that support to um, those who have one and two year olds. So thinking about extending those 15 hours or 30 hours. And we think that that group is particularly important because you have a real gap in support there, particularly where you have um, um, individuals, and obviously this again is primarily women coming up to the end of parental leave, and then the further support um, really kicks in when you get to three years. So potentially, if people are making that decision about whether or not to re-enter the labour market at the end of that parental period. And we find if they step away, then that tends to be for a couple of years. And you lose that attachment to, to the labour market, to your previous employer. And quite often what you see happens then is people come back at lower paid, um, lower skill kind of jobs and things like that. So it can not only have an impact on participation now, but potentially kind of lifetime earnings as well, if you take out that big gap in the labour market. So we think that really needs to be a focus. Um, the second group in terms of long-term sick, again, I think it's really important to focus on prevention there and where employers can have a really big role about the support that they can offer to individuals in the workplace. Um, it's quite interesting, though, in terms of some of the support that can be provided, particularly around mental health, kind of ergonomic support and musculoskeletal conditions. So those are the kind of three biggest um, uh, health issues in the workplace. None of those are covered by the kind of benefit in kind system. So we think that that system does need to be updated to take into account um, these conditions. And then secondly as well, some of it is actually following through on, on support that government has previously pledged. So um, particularly for SMEs, this can be something that's quite difficult to offer um, a, a kind of robust package and particularly around occupational health. The government had previously pledged to provide subsidies for SMEs. Those have never actually come to fruition. So actually delivering through on that, particularly for that, that SME community, would be really uh, important to have that support uh, for individuals in the workplace. So that's not only reducing uh, hopefully people flowing off, but hopefully would us also give confidence to those who, who are able to move back that they would be supported in that employment. And obviously there's a lot that employers have done, particularly over the last couple of years and through the experience of the pandemic of thinking about um, mental and, and kind of physical health conditions in the workplace, offering more flexible working, etc. So that all needs to continue, but I think it needs to be a, the whole package as well. Um, so those are some of the particular things at the spring budget. I, I won't go into to detail into thinking about um, uh, jobs of the future, but I do think alongside this, we do need to think about how we are ensuring people do reskill throughout their working lives, particularly thinking about at the moment where jobs now um, have a larger focus on perhaps digital or on the decarb agenda to make sure that we are having that kind of lifelong learning. And then secondly, also to think a little bit more about automation and the role that AI can play, particularly in terms of adoption as well. Um, and that's particularly the case if we are perhaps seeing the ageing workforce mean that, that we're not going to see that growth in the labour supply um, as much as we have relied on over the last few years as well. So um, really great, as I say, that we're talking about this issue today. I think it, it needs to be the big focus of the spring budget. And as I said, at the moment when we're talking to businesses, it is really something that's holding back growth in the UK. So um, really good to, to have the discussion today. Right, thank you, Louise. We're talking at the beginning about the, ch so the Chancellor's obviously big thing for the budget is what policy measures does, does he announce, but the poor people down at the OBR over there somewhere <laughs> have to decide what bit of this weaker labour supply to put into their forecasts, yeah, and which is the dominant thing. Like You can assume they're going to be suicidal about productivity rates in the UK going forward. They will be, I promise. But the question is, what are they going to put in for labour supply, which was growing fast in the last decade? 
has had a bad hit during the pandemic, how much do you weight the recent bad news versus the longer term good news for your future forecast? Because if you do what the Bank of England did, you end up with everything looking yeah. suicidal, very bad yeah. productivity, very bad labour supply growth, which is why the Bank of England's got 0.7% growth in the medium term in their forecast, down from 1.7 in the last decade. So you thought the last decade was bad? Take another percent off it. Yeah. And remember, it was 27 before the financial crisis. Yeah. Okay, so that is why this matters in terms of long-term economic performance. And it's why the OBR is going to have to make some big decisions about what goes into those forecasts. It's not going to affect the short term. The short term stuff is much more about energy costs and all that, right? But what do you think about the medium term? This is the, this is the only really big judgment left for the OBR. The, um, right, Fiona. Great, thank you. Uh, well, thank you, um, Louise and colleagues, for um, a great report. And as you know, there's a growing interest in economic inactivity, and not least in the West Midlands, which has a, a both a historical and a current um, higher rate than the UK average. And what I really like about this report is not just the clear analysis, but a sense of which of those issues you should try and do something about, and which of those you should leave. And that's that's really important in deciding uh, which actions to take. Now. Most of the actions focus quite rightly in advance of the budget on thinking about what can be done nationally through tax, through benefits, through pensions, through childcare. They're really critical, but so too is what happens locally. Because as those national levers are pulled, our role at the West Midlands Combined Authority and our partners, our role is to ensure that local support is available to help local residents get those local opportunities to either stay in the labour market or to return to it. So let me tell you a little bit about the West Midlands um, to start with. Um, the report shows that there's been quite a variation across regions. I would also say that within regions that variation um, is even greater. But as a region, we have a very young, a very diverse population. Um, unemployment, as everywhere, is historically low, but we have um, a relatively high um, unemployment rate compared to the rest of the country. And for those in work, we have below average pay levels, so a real set of difficult challenges. Now, over the last year, we've experienced rising inactivity, although most recently it has dipped, as we've seen actually lots of students um, go back into the labour market. They are our biggest group uh, because we're a young region. About a quarter of our economically inactive are long-term sick. About one in five are um, looking after family or home. If you take the combined authority area, which is slightly smaller than the region, then actually only about 7% have retired. So actually it's quite helpful to know that we don't have to do anything about that group because most of our people um, aren't in that category. So this is a really critical issue for us because the people who are affected, are our residents, the businesses who are struggling to fill their vacancies, and there are lots of those, and they say it's holding back their growth, um, they're our local economy. And therefore, we see it as our job alongside what happens in the budget to help people find good opportunities to get people um, the right support to access them. So um, all the things that Stephen mentioned actually are taking place within the region and, and it was great to hear um, some of those suggestions. But I want to, to make three brief um, uh, suggestions for things that local areas can do and give you a couple of examples for the West Midlands. So first of all, I think local areas can shape their local employment support offer to help people get back into the labour market. We know at the moment only one in 10 older people and disabled people get help to find work and we need to expand that to help people stay in the labour market and to get quickly back in when they leave. Um, whether that's through our UK Shared Prosperity Fund, although we need investment on that to be brought forward around this issue, whether it's expansion of the Restart programme or whether it's new ways of working. So in one of our Job Centre Plus offices, particularly focused on people age 50 plus to give them the right environment to help them find work. Secondly, local areas can align that employment support with a whole range of other levers and interventions to create a place-based solution, whether that's skills, childcare, transport, health. Um, so, for example, Transport for West Midlands, which is in the Combined Authority, are exploring how we can use £4 million of our passenger-led incentive programme to support a range of groups, including those who are starting a new job, to be the costs of travel, overcoming some of those kind of first hurdles to whether work pays. And thirdly, local areas can play a really important leadership role, both as employers in our own right, but also working with employers 
to create good employment opportunities in our local area, whether that's more high quality jobs, secure work, flexible working. Actually, with those good jobs, it is easier to keep people into the labour market and to attract them when they fall out. So that for us includes a focus on inward investment, working with our existing employers and harnessing the investment that comes through major projects such as HS2. Now, two specific examples of where we're trying to integrate services locally and work with employers um, that we think are absolutely confident are delivering results in the West Midlands. First of all, we're trying to work really hard to integrate our employment and our skills offer. So um, DWP SWAT program, sector-based work academies, um, we have devolution of the adult education budget, which pays for the training. And it means because of the flexibilities within that, we can offer a more holistic program, better tailored to the needs of local employers. And actually, we started to deliver better employment outcomes um, for it. We've been able to open up the program as well to those residents who are economically inactive, not just those who are unemployed. And that's only possible because we have devolution of the skills budget. Secondly, we're looking at how we integrate employment support with our health services. So we have a program called Thrive Into Work. It offers free one-to-one -one job support based on an IPS model. It's a personalised approach to helping people with health problems or a disability, either to stay in the jobs that they have or to find employment. It's led by our health service providers, so referrals from primary and community care. And it has enabled us to extend the reach of our employment support to those who are inactive. And importantly, as part of that programme, we're also working with employers to think about how they create um, workplaces that can better retain those people with health conditions, with disabilities and with the need for other flexibilities. And again, devolution and place-based leadership is really important. When I think about the budget, I think about the fact that the West Midlands and the Greater Manchester Combined Authority are negotiating a trailblazer devolution deal with central government in which we hope employment and skills will be a key feature and the government will be ambitious about that. Actually, further devolution in this area will enable us to better respond to the needs of our local labour market and our residents. So I guess what I would say is I'm really um, struck by um, how the report has got what I think are some really important recommendations. Um, I think regionally we need to act too, and I'm hoping that the budget delivers for both of us. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Olivia. <laughs> Who doesn't want a trailblazer deal? The, um, sounds very exciting. Who doesn't want to be trailblazed? We're going to find out who gets trailblazed. The answer is uh, you guys in uh, Manchester, but we'll find out on the 15th probably. The, um, right, now, you basically all asked too many questions already. So I'm slightly loath to say it, but it is on Slido, hashtag boost participation. And we're going to try and vaguely do justice to the like, really great questions there's loads of, as well as doing some uh, polls. So briefly, I think we should touch on a bit of the detail about what's actually happening, in brackets, insofar as we can tell. And then let's spend most of the time, we've got half an hour, so there's most of the time on what earth should actually get done, because that's the bit of the conversation that's slightly lacking in the... Uh, in academic land. So the, as a first question, a few people have asked this, but here's a simple version of it, which is basically, okay, what about gender? So we didn't touch on that much. Louis showed us one chart of the split in gender in the past. But in terms of what's going on right now, how different is what's going on? So I guess when we look at differences by gender, we should also look at differences um, among different age groups. So I guess among older people, we have seen both men and women um, have an increase in economic inactivity. But it's among the kind of younger age groups, so people in their kind of 30s to 50s, where the story looks quite different. For women, particularly those in their 30s and 40s, we've seen a continuation of the trend in the 2010s, where actually we're seeing inactivity fall. And that's particularly among those who were inactive due to looking after family or home. And I guess it's a longer running trend of single parents and women in couples with children entering employment. Whereas for men, um, we're seeing an increase in inactivity, among other things, due to rising health problems. But those two things more or less offset them, offset each other in that kind of middle age group. But yeah, I think it's a good point. Underneath the surface, there's lots of complexity, both by age and by gender. Great. Should we then, another question is on, is it just the economic cycle, basically? Is it short version of this so the um you get if i can bring up yes here we go okay so ignore the first bit on the who knows what's going on with the data it's all very complicated uh, the report has lots on that but on is it just the economy stupid so broadly when you get recessions 
pandemic was quite a big recession, remember? Feels like a long time ago, but it's quite a big one, 25% fall in GDP. So in general, you see two different pressures going on. A load of people have time out of the labour market, and so they're less likely to work, but a load of other people's income just got hammered because a recession generally hammers our income, and so there's a push into work, or at least into activity, to want to work because you're basically, you'd like some money. Okay, and those two things, and where they net out in different recessions is why you get the 1980s looking very different to the 2008. Some people are vaguely looking like they're still with me. Yes, good, <laughs> nodding over here. Good, right, so that's like, so that, this question is important. Now, Louise, do you want to take this one on in terms of, like, this one was different in terms of, Obviously, you can all remember vaguely if you haven't blanked it out because it was so painful. It wasn't a normal recession. No, that's it. And I, I think, as Louise was saying at the beginning, that normally we'd expect unemployment would be the thing that, that would be rising. And actually, you know, that hasn't happened this time round. And it, it has been the inactive population that has grown instead. And I think that that is particularly worrying because then they do tend to be a much harder group to get back. Um, and I think that's why it's right that we're having this conversation. And, and yes, there are people who have left and probably won't come back. Um, and I think that's where we will have a lasting impact from this. But actually, there are lots of people who are in that, that, that kind of um, group that we can encourage to come back. But yeah, it's very different to then thinking about previously, what about the, the unemployed population and those who we have actually got quite a lot of programmes and who are a lot closer to the labour market. I think that's why this is quite challenging. In most recessions, loads of 59 year olds don't get told to not go to work for 18 months. So I don't think it's that surprising that loads of 59 year olds behaved a bit differently after this one to a normal recession. They, um, you know, in the end, you, like we always used to talk about hysteresis. All the 1990s economic textbooks talk about hysteresis in terms of people becoming unemployed, then finding it harder to go back into work. Hysteresis this time, your lifestyle changed very drastically and it stayed changed for an extended period of time. If you had financial options open to you to take different lifestyle decisions afterwards, I don't think it's massively surprising. But I don't think we should conclude that means that's what happens in every recession because we're not planning to tell everyone to stay at home for 18 months when the next recession starts, just in case a bug starts circulating, I don't think. Are we? No. OK, phew. <laughs> well, you're, you are in charge with, due to the whole democracy thing. So, the, um, uh, Right, I think we should, we've done that. On the, we should do the 65 pluses. I don't know if you want to do this video. So at the beginning, the chart shows that most of this discussion, right, is about basically 55-year-olds to mid to later 60s, 50-year-olds, sorry, I should say, to mid, but half of the increase amongst older workers there is amongst the 65 pluses. The, um, do, you, Finna, do you think we should worry about that group or focus on the kind of, I don't know what we're calling, the, the younger, older workers? Um, it, it strikes me from the discussion we've had so far that we need to think about younger workers because they're 65 plus. Um, I mean, there may be people who want support. We should make sure that there's an offer for them if they do, but that this is unlikely to be a choice that they make. I'm particularly concerned about the growing number of 19 to 24 year old, particularly men actually in our region, um, that are inactive um, because whether or not they want to work at the minute, that is an awful lot of life left to be outside of the labour market and all the advantages they have there. So I think this report is really helpful in thinking about what can we do for um, parents, predominantly women, uh, with childcare and other caring responsibilities and those young people so that we can make a significant change in their life chances. Good. There is something weird going on, which is even when we've had this like record employment levels all the way through the last decade, if you look at the number of people who have never worked, so workless households coming down, yeah, all of the IDS stuff about loads of intergenerational worklessness, largely nonsense, been coming down consistently for two decades, but the number of individuals who have never worked headed up. And the reason it headed up that no one ever talks about is this, which is young people not doing a job in the weekends when they were 16 and 17. Whatever you employers say, none of you employ 16 and 17 year olds anymore, like they don't want them. They, um, and then you don't do, students are much less likely to be working while they're doing their degrees nowadays. So, yeah, and so you get people getting to 25, having never worked, then they're unlucky, they become ill. And so you end up with this big number of people who have never worked that we didn't used to have because everybody used to do some work when they were young, even if they then ended up with a longer period of unemployment later. We never talk about it, we never do anything about it. But if you want, if you, that is really important and it's really hard. That's like about employers wanting to, like, you know, it, all you pubs out there that aren't going bust, the ones that aren't going bust, you need to employ some 16 year olds, get them washing, 
that'll teach you about the real world really fast. That's, that's my like, you know, most unwoke sentence of the day. <laughs> the, um, right, I want to do Jamie's question. So Jamie's basically asking us, if I can find Jamie's question amidst everyone else's question, which is basically, okay, but what about other countries? The, um, is this really that different? Can't find Jamie's question. Jamie, here you go, Jamie, phew, right. Here we go, right. Basically, should we all chill out? It went up loads in the 2010s. Uh, you got some good luck. Life swings and roundabouts is what economists call the reversion to the mean. Right. So it went a bit up higher than average in the last decade. It's coming down a bit. Should we all just chill out? Is it that different to other countries internationally? You're not allowed to answer that question yet, although you can answer it in five seconds because we're going to do a poll on the lines of it. So here we go. What happened, people? Remember, it's hashtag, what did I say? It was boost participation. So UK's participation rate down by about 0.8 percentage points. Quite a bit, but not like massive since the pandemic. What has happened to the OECD, the typical OECD country, so like a similar-ish economy, over the last, over exactly the same period? Did it fall by less than that, the 0.7%? Um, uh, did it basically stay flat? So most people basically stayed the same. Did it go up a bit or did it go up loads? The, um, the, so while you all vote on that, I'm trying to find a way for you guys to answer this without cheating and giving everybody the answer. Let's do it this way. How good was, let's do the bit of Jamie's question, which is like, how good was the UK's participation rate before the pandemic? Don't do anything with COVID in it. Go on, Louise. Um, so we were pretty good. So out of the 38 OECD countries we, in 2019, before the pandemic, we were seventh highest. So I think we shouldn't forget that. And I think it is right to put this debate in, in context. Our participation rate is much higher than many countries we think of as similar. Um, we started the pandemic higher than Germany, much higher than the US or Italy or Ireland. Um, so it's certainly worth bearing in mind that when we think of some of the UK's problems compared to international countries, productivity or investment, some of those are much bigger than historic levels of participation. Yeah, are are there any big it. ones in the six that, that were better than us? So Iceland is um, always top and remains um, remains top. Where, where is that? Iceland. 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 Right. Uh, Northwest. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Specifically where it is, but the um, yeah, it's very small. Yeah, yeah. Active volcanoes, active population <laughs> too. That's what is going on. Right, you've all voted very speedily and you have dangerous levels of consensus either you're all cheating or not right come on let's bring up the answer on the screen so we've got a mixed split here we go on the bottoms here we go right so i think that counts as a clean you would call that a win in a first past the post election but the um, uh, but broadly people think 41 percent. now i think we've got a chart we can bring up to show you the actual answer i'm looking over at tara to she's nodding at me so i'm going to fill space while she brings out the answer here you go louise what is this so, yeah, this shows, um, if we look at the shaded lines, that's participation rates for kind of all working age adults, so those 15 to 64. In the green, we see the UK, where the picture has been pretty negative since the pandemic. Um, and what we can see in the sort of third one along, so the middle blue bar is what's happened to the sort of median OECD country. And what we actually see is participation's increased by over a percentage point. So what's that 1.2 percentage points since 2019? Um, and also interestingly, if we just look at the red bars, both France and Germany against countries, we tend to compare ourselves to have seen participation rise. Um, and I guess just finally, what the solid bars are is participation just among those older workers, those aged 55 to 64. And similarly, we can see in France and Germany and in the OECD median country, participation increase for those, um, for that age group, even more so than the, the general population. So the UK is, is an outlier in this regard. So you are all too optimistic about the relative performance of the UK. So 1.2 is a big increase amongst the OECD on average. The on average effect of the, of the crisis is to push up activity rates significantly. And so that what actually stands out is slightly less that ours has gone down hugely, which it has gone down a bit, but it's that everyone else has basically um, gone up. Louise has got a great chart in the um, report showing our relative position falling from 7th to 15th. Yep. The, um, so it's the relativity that makes this stand out quite so much rather than just the absolute fall in activity. Right, OK, we're going to do the answers in 20 minutes. Uh, what can possibly go wrong? So let's start. We're going to do older workers. We're going to do those with um, in ill health or disability. And then we're going to do 
um, prime age women with, uh, with children mainly to go through it. If other people want to raise the activity rates of other groups, that is really good. We've got timed out. Um, but you can come up with your plan for the 16 year olds um, separately. Right? Older workers, quite a lot of the questions are in the space of um, discrimination. So Stephen, do you want to take this one first mm -hmm. from Sadie? Which is basically, older friends are saying they, they don't feel valued, their experience was not appreciated, the, um, and the change of attitudes of some employers needs to basically happen. If we don't sort out the culture, we ain't getting them. The, um, so let's do two things. Do we, do we think, one, that is a problem? Probably. And do we think that is the problem that's caused us is that what's changed is that what's driven and has that got anything to do with what's just happened and those are two different questions mm. what do you think well I, I i i do think it's a problem um I, I don't think it's new i think it's probably been a something that's been there for a, a long time um but i think it it will need to change i think if we're going to resolve this relatively new problem that we're we're grappling with um and i think specifically that employers need to look at whether they can offer more flexibility to their employees in order to encourage older workers who may well have you know, caring responsibilities and uh, other things going on in order to entice them back into work. I think the other point is that we, we need to think about how to support specifically older people. I think hoping that if we do something like Restart, that all the people will benefit from it. I don't think that is going to work. I think we have to think quite hard, specifically, how do we support this group into work? Probably with specific programmes, that's why we're going to mass hire in mm -hmm. Boston, which is specifically uh, about that. And I think here, there is an important uh, part of the case for devolving employment support, because I think as Fiona was saying, to do this well, you've got to bring together job centres, education, colleges, and the health service. And you can't do that if you try and organise it from Whitehall. You can only do it, I think, at a, a, a much more localised level. Very good. Now, Fiona, quite a lot of the policy discussion since people started getting active on inactivity since the summer has been, let's design a really good back-to-work programme for the over 50s. The, um, and that sometimes the word retraining gets mentioned to kind of jazz it up a bit, but broadly, uh, and then it will all be all right. Yeah. Here's an unfair question. Can you name me a single back to work programme for the over 50s in any country that has had a high success rate? Um, I can't off the top of my head. What I can uh, suggest, and there's probably people in the audience who can are shouting at the screen now, which is what I'd probably do at home and, and could remember it. <laughs> But I think Don't shout at Resolution Foundation event. <laughs> <laughs> you should be sitting there in joy, rapture, <laughs> sipping a cup of tea. But I, I think big programmes can often feel off-putting. Personal support, which is focused on you and your needs, can be much more effective. And therefore, thinking about building confidence, mentoring, the skills you might need that aren't a big programme, that aren't a shortened apprenticeship because I think that would be a terrible idea and being able to bring together a range of things together I think can be really helpful that has to be personalized um, I think it can be effective but you don't get it by designing these massive programs and pushing people through them yeah the, um, so I spend a lot of time in this area and I can't name you one program that's seen there's things that have good results on a few individuals right so for well-being reasons and others but in terms of aggregate inactivity rates I think we should be really we should, if we put loads of our eggs in the DWP slash local areas running really good back to work support for the 55 pluses, it's an optimist. I think it doesn't mean you shouldn't try, but that definitely, you, if you put all your eggs in that basket, looking around the OECD, I give you low chance of uh, success. Someone should definitely do that. Yeah. But I'll, I'll let you know how Mass Hire is doing. Let's see how the Mass, let's have, see how mass Hire is doing. In the US, they basically have tried, they've got terrible results on most of their retraining programs over the course of like lots of their post deindustrialization retraining schemes that they've implemented over the years not that where was it you were visiting where is Mass Hire? Boston. Boston. Boston so Boston's a different uh, way isn't where lots of their inactivity is but the um in, amongst older workers falling out of manufacturing employment lots of retraining schemes mm. generally terrible terrible results some of the like, large numbers of them make it worse <laughs> they take someone out of job search for a year and make it worse for them going their employment rates are lower having done the program than if they didn't do the program the, um, so not that we should be just results orientated you know politicians got something to announce that was nice the um, now let's do pensions the um, so everyone wants to increase the sp 
A, the by everyone I mean the Treasury. The um, so let's just let's just do. So Stephen has voted. You have voted through. We're we're going to sixty eight in the current legislation. We're going to sixty eight in the forties, twenty forties. Yeah. The government policy after the last review is that we should go earlier in the late thirties. Yeah. And the policy discussion really. Not the legislation. The policy discussion is: Should we go to 68 in the mid 2030s or the late 2030s? That's what's actually on yeah. the table. In Whitehall, what are they rowing about? That. Yeah. What do you think, Stephen? Um, well, the government has carried out a review, or, or commissioned oh, Baroness uh, Lucy Neville Rolfe to carry out a review. They received the report from Baroness Neville Rolfe in September. They should have published it. So which we which would, they we presumably will in the budget. I well, presume. presumably they will. Um, but you know, when this exercise was last done by John Cridland in 2017, he did the review, he published it, we had it for four months, and then we found out what the government thought. It appears now that we're not going to see the review until we get the government announcement, which I, I think is completely uh, wrong-headed. I, I, my, my sense is that it would be uh, unjustified to accelerate even further the that, that increase to, to because 68. Because actually life expectancy isn't going up as fast at the moment as we all thought it was going to. Um, and so the case for a further rise, I, as far as I can see, isn't there. But I'd, I'd love to see the evidence that the government has had since last October. Here's an unfair take on what politicians have voted for recently, which is, so we've voted to increase the state pension age over time, which is the thing that drives retirement decisions for lower earning workers, lower income households, right? That's what, if you look at like retirement rates amongst poor households, it's like, except for those with ill health, it's basically ticking along and then just shoots up at state pension age for obvious reasons, which is you can't afford to live with no money. And the only money you're going to get is if you want disability benefits. That's the only alternative. The only way you're retiring early if you're poor is that, right? Amongst richer households, it's a much more fluid across the late 50s and early 60s decision because private pensions are doing a lot of the work. On private pensions, while voting to increase the state pension age, what we've been done, done is allowing people to access their tax relief pensions earlier. That's what the Pension Freedoms decision in 2014 did. It wasn't discussed in this context. It wasn't meant to boost early retirement. It was meant to be fun and flexible and stop you having to annuitise. But the effect of it is to allow people who are then 55 to access tax relieved private pension wealth, which, can, which does determine people's retirement rates in the UK for those with high wealth, while those with low wealth, we were like, see you at 68. The, um, now, we didn't do that intent. I don't think George Osborne, who was involved in both of those, did that intent. I don't think he was intentionally doing the opposite. And remember, the people with the high wealth are the ones that live a long time. Right? Who is the state pension worth most to? Rich people, because they live longer. Even though the amount is similar, they live longer, they get more years of it, it's worth more. Right? So we basically said, okay, those of you that are going to live longer, you can retire earlier, pension freedoms. Those of you that are going to die sooner, hello Glasgow, are going to get your state pension later, so you're going to work longer. Was that a good idea? Um, uh, that was an unfair I, 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 well, I, No, I think, I think there is the, the, the risk of serious kind of injustice arising from all of this. I mean, Louise made the point that the, uh, the age for accessing your private pension is going up to 57. I can't remember yeah. when, yeah. That's, when that's due to happen. 68. Yeah, later this decade. Yeah, yeah. 2026 to 2020, 2028. Over yeah, those two years, yeah, yeah. So that <coughs> you know, there there is a move in in, in that. Still direction. ten years below the SBA, though. Yeah, ten years below. I mean, the one the one thing John Cridland suggested was that people should be able to access pension credit a little bit earlier than the state pension. I think that was a kind of you know a, a, a move in the right direction to start to address what otherwise does look like growing injustice for people on lower incomes and in poorer health. What do you think, Louise, on the pensions? Where are you on? What's the CBI's position on raising the So, I, I think the wider point for us is around if you are increasing the state pension age or looking at it and having this debate, are we providing that support alongside it to make sure that people are able to work longer? And I think, like I say, employers are doing a lot, particularly over the last couple of years, in thinking about the flexible options that they can offer. And actually, it's quite interesting where... Employees have done a lot over this last year to think about how they re can retain their workers in the face of very high vacancies. If you're thinking about um, what salary you're offering, that is the primary thing and pretty much the only thing that those like under 25 care about. 
but actually for those at the older age group it is they're much more interested in like what are the flexible working options you know to what extent they can work at home etc and i think that we need to continue to keep those high up the agenda and also as i say and particularly for those individuals that might be in more manual jobs where can we perhaps retrain and reskill those within the company and that i think is where you tend to then keep people attached rather than okay we're going to have an aim to reskill you in a completely different industry as you say programs like that never seem to work but i think these these discussions need to happen alongside each other otherwise you're just pushing up that pension age and it's 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 going to be um, very rough for a lot of people can i just make a point we are taking evidence tomorrow morning in the select committee about the state pension age issue uh, john cridland i'm pleased to say is giving evidence to us Baroness Neville Rolfe, who's become a minister now, <coughs> having done her review, um, understandably kind of felt she couldn't come and talk to us because her report yeah. hasn't been published. But uh, you know, we, 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 uh, it's a very much a live topic. If we'd done, I mean, the, obviously, the, I mean, I've generally supported increase in the state pension age, so I don't understand. It's the juxtaposition versus what we've done mm. to richer mm. people that is the most, is the egregious point. That's, I think, the really indefensible bit. Mm. On, I think if you, because the Cridland position, for those of you who didn't spend your life in this area, who've made other lifestyle decisions, was we'll keep increasing the SBA at the pace that keeps the percentage of your life in retirement constant. A third. A third, yeah. That want, was the policy yeah. justification for the increases. Yeah. Longevity's rising, we'll keep it at a third, and we'll use that to determine the rate of the increases. The challenge that Treasury's got now is, in the past, that meant keep increasing it. If anything, now it means decelerate because basically longevity hasn't risen as we expected. I think if you did that now, you would probably go into the 2050s. You wouldn't be going forward to the 2030s. You'd be delaying mm -hmm. from the Cridland review. Mm -hmm. No, you're going back into the 2040s. Sorry. You go back into the 2040s mm -hmm. rather than bring it forward. So if you're going to argue for an increase in the SPA, accelerating it now, you've basically got to argue on the other grounds. You can't argue on the Cridland longevity point. You've got to say, um, well, they've got to work or we're bust or something else. You, you've got to come up with a different reason because you can't go out and defend your previous position because or you've got to say a third was wrong. So like, I think that's worth thinking about. What's the underlying justification for this position? That, that has definitely changed. Right, let's touch on um, disability and ill health. Because I think one thing we maybe didn't... I think it's really important for us to understand, like, well, Louise, why don't you just... When did it start? <laughs> When's the problem actually beginning? Yeah, so I guess... There's yeah a few things to look at. The share of the working age population with a disability has been increasing gradually over the past decade or so. Um, so yeah, an increase of around 2 million since 2013. Then when we look at inactivity due to ill health, so it's a slightly different, you know, well, a very different metric. So that's people that are out of work citing their health or disability as a reason why they can't work or look for work. We really saw that start to increase from around 2019. So before the pandemic, obviously not not long before, but we shouldn't see it as being directly related to the pandemic or long COVID or lockdowns. It does look like that was increasing before then. And the other kind of, I guess, evidence point that makes us think that this is a wider trend that's not just related to the pandemic is when we look at the types of illnesses that people cite when they're inactive due to health problems, they vary hugely. So it's not just you know, either respiratory problems that we might think of as being influenced by COVID or just mental health problems. It's pretty broad across different um, different types of ill health. Um, I guess then the final thing is just, we do a lot of research using survey data. And I think there's definitely, you know, we should take all of that with a bit of a pinch of salt. People talk about illness differently. People rate different health problems differently. But we're also seeing this uptick in, health problems when we look at administrative benefits data, so claims for PIP, which is the main out of work, non means tested disability benefit have increased for um, across age groups. So not just among older worker, older people, but among young people too. Fiona, why don't you come in on this on, so on this, for the discussion in how do you increase participation rates um, for those with in ill health or disability, and probably you should think about those two things slightly differently, tends to focus on what can you tweak in the benefit system to bring people back into work who have exited work? That's what most, because that's how Whitehall's got that lever. So that's the thing you think about. The question someone's asking here, which we'll hopefully bring up in a second, someone called GP. They may or may not be a GP. Here we go. Right. How can we further support people with this to return to the workforce? So that's in the returning bucket. And those who have long-term conditions through a supportive approach as opposed to sanctions. So let's, let's take, I suppose, the sanctions meaning benefit changes generally. What about, my only other thing is, what do you think is the balance between this, which is, 
how do we encourage a return to the workforce versus how do we discourage an exit from the workforce in the first place when you become in health? What's your balance? How much do you care about those two things? Um, so obviously I care about all of them. I think the easiest thing is to keep people in the labour force, in the workforce, rather than waiting for them to drop out where it is expensive and difficult to get people back. So thinking about, and, and it's what we do in our Thrive at Work programme, working with employers to think about what sort of flexibilities, what sort of support, how do you use access to work to keep people within the labour market so that you're not dealing with those challenges of people leaving and then having confidence and mental health issues on top of that um, to get back. Um, I, I think you're right about the, the um, variety of, of issues that people are facing. We are seeing certainly um, via our um, Job Centre Plus work coaches and other kind of stakeholders in the community saying mental health is becoming a, a much bigger issue, particularly for our young people. If you think about the, the economy of the West Midlands with lots of engineering and manufacturing. Traditionally, we would have thought of this being about kind of actually got getting too old and unwell to be able to do those heavy lifting jobs. Actually, it feels very different now. So one of the things we're thinking about within our employment support, so we've got this IPS model, which um, we think is really good value for money, but it's not cheap. What we're thinking about is how do we take the usual employment support model and put some mental health support alongside it because actually when you deal with issues like confidence with anxiety with this kind of low level mental health issues we need to support people um, into work and then the confidence and perhaps mentoring to carry on at work um, rather than just waiting to people to get to a very critical stage and then trying to throw everything at them which in many cases doesn't work it's much, much harder um, later and more of the discussion. I mean, we touched on it in the report, but more discussion on what could you do to basically make it much less likely that people's work relationship ends as soon as they become ill is like, definitely what we should be um, what we should be doing more of. Let's touch on work quality the, um, and lower skilled workers in general, which is relevant particularly to older workers, to their workers and, and to women. So, Louis, do you want to come on this? Which is, I mean, if there were better jobs, people would be doing them. Yeah, I think it's something that I guess is often missing from this debate. I think generally, so not just for older workers, we have seen work become more stressful, more intense, and that's particularly true among lower paid jobs where there used to be this kind of, I guess, premium that your job might be low paid, but it was seen as being quite you know, not stressful. You know, it was a job and when you went home, you didn't have to worry about it. And that's less true today than it was, say, in the 90s. And recently we did some focus groups with, older workers who told us just that both the lack of flexibility of some jobs but also just the intensity of them means that if they were to continue into their 60s it's just it just doesn't feel possible to do that job full-time um, so I think we need to think a about making part-time work possible if that is an option for people where full-time work isn't um, but also yeah increasing the the quality of work for example giving people notice of their shifts you know we know that older workers are more likely to be juggling work with caring responsibilities say for a, a partner or for grandchildren or have their own health problems to to be juggling alongside work and so employers should you know reflect that and give people due notice of their shifts yeah, they, um, that is definitely. I mean, it's worth, it's worth looking at like where low earners are in the age range. The, the youth is doing loads of the low earning work. By youth, I mean like not youth, but like you know, early thirties up to early thirties, and they, um, and then it's fifty five pluses. Like it's a U shape who is doing the low earning work in the UK, and and you definitely hear people, older workers, saying, "I ain't staying doing that." I mean, I'll stay doing something part time, but I'm not staying doing that five days a week into my. Late fifties, totally uns uns uh, unsurprisingly. The um, right, Louise, childcare. Everyone says they want more childcare support. Yep. Uh, they'd like the treasury to cough up for some of it. We say that. You guys say that. Uh, the TUC says that. The um, are you at all worried that we've got in terms of focusing on what will actually boost employment? So the policy discussion in Whitehall is dominated by people that do professional jobs, lots of whom are two earning couples who want subsidised childcare because it's improved their incomes, right? And not all, unless some of them that don't, aren't working, but most people are two earners or one earner if they're a single parent, they, um, and they want subsidised childcare because it will boost their incomes, but it won't raise their employment rates because they're already in. Are we slightly worried, I mean, I want that as well, but just to be absolutely clear. Um, are we slightly worried that our focus on extra free hours, fixing the system, which is obviously broken as well, but is basically because upper middle class people really care about this, but for everyone else, other things would matter more for employment. 
So I think it's where it is worth, worth looking at the whole system because I don't, I don't actually think there is one kind of silver bullet here that is going to solve everything. It's going to be a mix of things and obviously different households in different positions, certain things will matter more to them. So I think that's why we are calling for, a, for an independent review on this and particularly to look at how the UK childcare market compares to others internationally where um, you perhaps have a lot more flexibility and definitely we see that the costs in the UK are much higher than elsewhere, particularly in terms of, of what the parents themselves bear. I think for us, there is this really big issue about the kind of gap in provision, though, and where if you are looking at ending kind of parental year at year old, that the significant help that you do definitely get with the 15 and 33 hours, that only comes in when, when the child is three. And so if that is the kind of support that you need, then you're ineffectively forced to kind of take an extra two years out of the labour market to what you would otherwise do. That usually means handing in your resignation with your current employer. And I think that all just makes it much harder to then get into work later on. I think you would have to look at if you were introducing that regime as we're calling for, for, for that kind of one and two year old group, think about is the conditionality to that? So is it just available as the 30 hours is for when you are in work rather than universal? But I think it is also worth thinking about some of the other benefits of the childcare support as well, particularly around social mobility and the importance of early years care. Actually, that is one of the advantages of the 15, year, 15 hours universal as well. So we should definitely care about participation. That's what we're here to talk about today. But there are kind of wider advantages to it as well. And to be fair, if you're in a two earner society, moving towards that being the norm, then you basically end up having to subsidise child costs more. That's basically the long term. No one ever talks about this, but child poverty goes up in a two-earner society. Mm -hmm. If you don't do more life cycle redistribution to the parents during that phase, you basically end up with higher child poverty and all the parents, whether they're upper, middle or lower class, screaming. Right, one more question in the room from a human, and then I'm going to start wrapping this up because I'm already uh, five minutes over due to lack of self-control. Yeah, uh, hi, thanks, Torsten. Phil Aldrich at Bloomberg. Um, I just wondered how much work incentives plays into all this. And... Um, because you've had, um, I mean, <coughs> uh, is, has you know, has the reservation wage increased um, over the pandemic? We've had, we've had the benefits top up um, through the cost of living mm -hmm. support packages. Um, we've got benefits rising in April at ten point ten percent, which is significantly faster than inflation, significantly faster than than the earnings rises. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, there's some speculation that you know it's easier to get onto incapacity benefits nowadays, um, and all of these things could just make it uh, partly, I guess, because mental health issues are more subjective. But um, so I just wonder, is this is this a, a big a big part of it? The work incentives have just have just been softened considerably since twenty you know, since February 2020. Okay, so we've got two things softening it. There, we've got people's wish to work has gone down for some pandemic related reason, and we've got the alternatives of like money you can earn by not working or not earn uh, has gone up relative to earnings, which is true in the very recent past, or will be true in April with this 10% up rating. Mm -hmm. It's obviously not true over the longer time period. But Stephen, work incentives, everyone snoozing? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, at the moment, the headline rate of benefits is the lowest for 40 years in, in real terms, you know, back to the kind of early Thatcher days uh, and the increase last April was 3% at the time when inflation was was 10%. So uh, cost of living support. I mean, there was all that additional cost of living support. There was, although uh, much of that was independent of whether you were working or not. So I, I mean, I, th I think it's quite hard to argue that at the moment, um, that the, the, the kind of the benefit underpin is a, in any sense a, a, a generous one. I, I take the point that in April it's going to go up by ten percent, but that really is just a, a catch up in, uh, with with, uh, with inflation. And thank goodness that's that's happening. So no, I I, I don't think the work uh, incentives have been reduced by what's happened in the the benefit system. Actually, if you look over the last 10, 13 years, the the reverse. Right, I want to do one last poll and then we're going to wrap up, which, and you guys are going to, you can get to answer this one before everyone else votes on it. So we'll bring up here, basically what's going to happen, right? Not what's going to get announced in the budget because you can all go and speculate on that. But we're, this is the long term. What is going to happen by, in 2030, what will have happened to workforce participation rates? Will it have continued to go down? Total panic. Will it have returned to pre-pandemic levels, i.e. gone back up by about a percent? Everyone calms down a bit and stops talking about it because they get bored. Will it have gone up further? 
and everyone will be panicking about overwork because they all thought that the whole thing was we were going to get a four-day week and actually what they got was working later uh, for the five days. Or will a post-work nirvana have arrived because, you know, the Marxists or the technoc technocracy people promised us it was going to turn up at some point and we're all just snoozing. So what's going to happen? Going to go up, going to go down further, going to go back to exactly where it was and we'll all just stop talking about it. Fiona, go. You only had one. I don't want all of uh, you above. I think we're going to... Um it's not going to be such a uh, newsworthy issue, but I think there's some ongoing challenges around our aging population, which means that we are, um, we are still going to have challenges around enough people to do the jobs that we have. So you want to half panic, half celebrate? Yes. That's very bold of you. Right. Um, Stephen, see if you can do better than just pick one. Uh, I, I think this is a serious issue that we need to address. I'm hoping for significant change in childcare support within universal credit in the budget. There's certainly been lots of mm -hmm. Conservative MPs uh, pressing for that. Um, and I think we are going to have to do things to encourage older workers to stay and work longer as well. All right. Louise, what's going on? I think that um, we do need to see some action if we want to see the participation rate recover again. I think there's a lot of things that will be pushing it down if we don't take action that there's a risk that that reduces. And even if we do see the participation rate recover a little bit, we still have that worry about the overall labour supply, as Fiona says, ageing workforce, etc. So what do you think is going to happen? So, uh, it's not just the OBR that has to forecast things. Well, that's it. I think I, I, I'm in a very similar, like, half panic, half celebrate, I'm afraid. <laughs> right, come on, other, other ways. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll commit to panicking, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> very calm I way. <laughs> Dad's army, but you're too young yeah. for the reference. <laughs> I think, I mean, who knows? Depends if we have a, you know, a huge policy package at the budget but I think particularly the the rise in ill health that we're seeing among younger people I think as Fiona said that is concerning if people become inactive when they're young that has big consequences on their length of time out of work and I think you know as time goes on this will become a, a growing problem. Very good. The um, excellent panic argument. How about we, pa I think we should panic on ill health and disability which is a complete car crash and we haven't got a clue what to do about it and we should get ready to celebrate increasing activity rates amongst older workers and women. I think both those two long-term trends, I reckon, are continuing. But the, long, the problem we've got with what's going on with disability is really scary. Mm. It's, the, the growth rates are just, like, really scary. And I think panic would be the right response to that. I can't remember. Who was the geezer in Dad's Army that panicked? Come on, Stephen. James. Was it? That's what, no, James. I thought it was a Scottish geezer. Anyway, whatever. Don't panic, people. It doesn't help anyway. Instead of panicking, why don't we thank our panel for their excellent offers this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for having us. Your votes were broadly into the uh, split between the... Basically, you all wanted to panic, because that's what kind of British people do. So off you go. Go and panic. Have a nice day. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you at a Resolution Foundation event soon.